Oh, and Celeste Headley's here. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us. Thanks for having me. Of course. I was just saying to you in the, in the green room a second ago, totally not intimidated at all to interview the interview expert. Well, look at it the other way. If I'm really great at conversation, you know this is going to go well. So. That's true. In my heart of hearts, I know that we're just going to have a great time. Right. Yeah. So welcome to having a great time. And congratulations <laughs> on this awesome book. Thank you. So much to talk about. I want to get to the book. I want to dig into some specifics. But first things first, how are you? I'm a little tired, I'm going to be honest with you, Matt. I'm a little tired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like my Fitbit was going crazy yesterday. Yeah, Got to get them numbers up, though. Yeah. Got to do it. Walking all over New York with a, and really regretting that, like, 30-pound bag. <laughs> yes. But, yeah. It's necessary, though. Um, right. So, uh, let me ask you a question. How does it feel, as someone like yourself, who, who will routinely do dozens of interviews uh, in a week, if not more, how does it feel being on the other side to talk about your book? Um, it's kind of a relief. Is it? Yeah, because when you're, you know this, when you're doing an interview, you're the one that's in control, right? You have your eye on the clock at all times. You're the yeah. one that's sitting, you've got a, I, when I'm on the radio, have like a bunch of screens in front of me and they're messaging me and blah, 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 blah. At the same time, you're trying to keep eye contact with the other person so they know you're paying attention. So it can be exhausting. But on this side, I'm like, it's all you, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Just lay back. <laughs> Ask a crappy question, and I'm going to give you a crappy answer. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Deal. Uh, you know, interesting side note there. You mentioned that when you're doing yours, you have a bunch of screens in front of you, doing all these things. So does that mean you break one of your rules, which is try not to multitask? That is correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, the human brain can't multitask. You can't do more than one thing right. at a time. But yeah, if you're a radio interviewer. You know, it's interesting enough, Terry Gross, who hosts Fresh Air. Yeah. Um, most people don't know she's never in the same room with the people she's interviewing. I'm part of most people, I didn't realize that. They're always in another room, and the reason for that is because she has her mic in front of her and the whole table is spread with her notes, right? So if they're in the same room, they're gonna see that she's never making eye, she's never looking at them. Like, yeah. So it turns out to be more intimate, they have a better feeling of intimacy if they don't see her doing that. That's fascinating, I yeah. had no idea. Um, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit slightly. I wanna talk about, like I said, the book, and I wanna talk about specifically how it kind of came to be. You said this is a culmination of five years of research yeah. and experience and observation. Take me back the five years and uh, tell me what was the thing that sparked this whole journey for you? So it was actually while I was hosting a show called The Takeaway here in New York, and I just wanted to get better at doing interviews, right? I mean, that's all you do when you're a professional interviewer is you listen to other people interviewing and you're like, damn it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Literally the reason I said we gotta get her in here. Exactly. <laughs> so I just wanted to get better at it and I started reading all the tip typical advice that you always got on how to have better conversations. Yeah. And I have the opportunity, because I work in, in radio, to, to immediately test those things out. And it was all crap. I mean, it did not work at all. And I started thinking, do these even people even try their own advice? Yeah. So I had to sort of start from scratch and say, OK, if none of this is true, yeah. then what is true? And that's so kind of where it all sort of started. And it's where all the reading, all the studies began, because I kind of started had to pull all this advice and wisdom from the best that we know about the way the human brain works. Um, which we don't actually know a lot, but of what we do know. Our best guess. <laughs> Our best yeah. guess at how it works, and it sort of led me to this better understanding. And then, of course, the next step was I realized that all those things that I was trying in the radio studio worked exactly the same way with my kid or my husband or yeah. in regular life. It was, it, in the end, a good conversation was a good conversation no matter where you were having it. Was it at all, did you ever find yourself a little exhausted in sort of juggling all these things? Because talk about multitasking. You're discovering these new techniques. You're trying to employ them in an interview. You're trying to have a great interview. Yeah. You're trying to do all these things at once. How did you sort of manage that throughout in the early beginning? Because I'm sure as you went along, it got better. Yeah, easier. it did. But it, I did the exact same thing that I advise that you do in the book, which is do one thing at a time, right? So when I was testing stuff out, one of the advice, of course, is to nod your head and say, uh-huh, to show you're uh -huh. listening, right? Um, <laughs> so I would totally test that out. You know, people would be talking, I'd be like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. You unless you, yeah unless you're George Clooney, you're not going to sell that. Right. Like that. You're, that's, you're, that's you pretending that you're paying attention when it turns out it's actually easier to just pay attention. <laughs> that was well, that was one of the things I found myself laughing at was you were like uh, you, you look like you're just faking it and nodding your head. Yeah. Like it's really embarrassing, and that you were watching the videos. You were like, what was I doing? 
Right, exactly. And people have a BS detector. They may be too polite to call you out on it, but they know when you're not listening. And, and I've had a number of issue in, uh, interviews where, A, I know they didn't read the book, and yeah. B, they're not actually listening to me. I know that. And I'm sorry, just smart. We'll trade notes afterwards. We'll see how <laughs> see, we hold up. You're good. You're Thank good. you. So far, so good. Awesome. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, so you have another, I think this was your second book, technically? Yeah, the first That's one is gray. really just aimed at a very small audience. Of it's people, very specific. Yeah, who people who want to make a radio show or podcast. That's yeah. it. Herd so. Mentality uh, was exactly. the first book. And there is kind of like a little bit about... Uh, 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 having great interviews. Yeah. So you start to kind of tap into that slightly. Um, so uh, this much more expensive, much more in-depth guide about not just interviews, honestly. I mean, I know I've probably shined a light on, like, this is great for interviews, but it's great for conversations, period. Right. That's the whole point. Uh, I'm curious about, uh, was there anything you learned, though, when you made that first book that you kind of brought with you to this next book? Yeah, I mean, the first step was sort of the, the first book was sort of the first step, right? That was me sort of figuring out how did interviews, but one interesting thing about it was that, and the reason that I published that book was I realized people who interview even professionally don't get trained to interview, no. right? No. They just say, oh, you're gregarious and charming and whatever, you go sit in front of a microphone. But even at NPR, the training in how to interview yeah is like really few and far between. We used to have a guy that helped us all the time named David Kandow, the sweetest guy in the world, and we called him the host whisperer at NPR. <laughs> um, but there's no replacement for him. And then this is also sort of what led me to the realization that even in regular life, we don't learn how to do this, right? Like a ton of people have been to a school where they offered public speaking, but how many people actually went to a school where they offered a course in listening? Right. Probably very few. Like very, yeah. very few. Uh, and you touch on that in your in your TED Talk, which mm -hmm. was almost kind of like the precursor to this book a little yeah. bit, where you explore a lot of the same things, and that's kind of what I love as a fan of that talk. In this book, you get to sort of expand upon all of right. those things and really uh, dig a little bit deeper. Uh, talking about the TED Talk for a second, that was not that long ago. That it's was 2015. 2015, And right? frankly, yeah. I didn't expect anybody to find it all that exciting. Like, I was like, this is a really boring topic, but I'm really jazzed about it, so yeah. I'm going to talk about it. I mean, you can tell because I, I enjoy my hair, put on makeup. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I thought 11 million people were going to be looking at that video, I probably would have just not wait, worn an old blazer. But a little more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think um, it, I was kind of heartened by the response to it because what it really means is that I think that there's a growing awareness that something's missing, right? I think people, there's a resonance, and this is like everywhere, it's not just the United States. Um, there's a, there's a, an understanding that something is going away and that's not a good thing. Well, that was what I, I really loved about those numbers was that it does speak to the idea that, that there's a, a thirst for this. People are looking. Right. Things go viral for like one of two reasons. Either there's a cat wearing some kind of outfit and it's adorable, right. or people are, are, are genuinely like either surprised or excited by that information. Third reason. Go for it. Someone's really embarrassed themselves. <laughs> <laughs> also also right. a reason things go viral. Right. So, uh, but yeah, in that moment, so you didn't expect it to hit 11 million and all that stuff. What was your immediate response to, oh my God, this has gone viral? Because I don't think your first thought was, I was wearing that blazer. It might have been. <laughs> it? No, I think my first thing was like, I kept refreshing it going, what? Oh, the, the counter's broke. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? And I remember like going on Facebook and going, oh my God, there's 100,000 views on my video. you know. And I thought that was like incredible. And then it started getting close to a million. I'm like, am I going to break a million? So it, uh, yeah, it just was sort of shock, I guess. Yeah. I didn't realize anybody else would be excited by conversation, right? Because even when people say this phrase soft skills, everyone, their eyes go dead, right? Everyone's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> they, Nobody we, wants two to Two of the cameras just turned off when I said that. <laughs> I'm telling Literally, you. Two of the, yeah. I'm telling you. So that's kind of what I figured when people saw that 10 ways to have a better conversation. Yeah. Thanks, mom. Um, I did not think. You know yeah. what's so funny about it though, too? If you read some of the comments on YouTube, which one, never do, but two, <laughs> If you do, some of them say exactly that. We're like, the title of this sounded so boring, but it blew my mind. Like people had the exact, like had that experience. Yeah, you could watch it sort of happen. I feel their pain. You know, there was, uh, there's a point. Uh, you kind of start the talk off talking about citing these numbers. Uh, I think it was a Pew poll saying that America at that point was it 2015 had never been more divided than right. it was at that time in recorded history. And I'm no scientist, <laughs> but I, I can only imagine that number and that chasm has kind of grown. I'm, oh, absolutely. I'm, and it, yeah, go absolutely. On. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to say, it's not Pew's numbers. Pew has only been tracking uh, polarization since I think the 19, maybe 50s or 70s. But by other measures, 
it, we are more divided now than we have been at any time except the Civil War when we were literally killing each other. So. Right. Well, so my, my uh, hope, I don't, I don't think, I'm optimistic, I don't think we'll get to that point, but my question for you is going to be, how does it feel as sort of this accidental conversational evangelist to like watch that chasm grow? You're trying so hard to like help people and push the needle in the other direction. How does it feel to like almost like the, 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 the horse has gotten away from the yeah, car? Yeah, that, like, that's a great question because frankly, to a certain extent, I feel a little bit like Cassandra screaming behind the walls of Troy, like, hello, <laughs> like do you not get, and the number of people that come up to me and say, yeah, but there really are people that you just can't talk to. And I'm like, okay, my whole, career right now is dedicated to proving you wrong. Yeah. Like literally, and some of them are like my friends and I'm like, a two Brute? Like what the hell? Do you ever find you yourself going, I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? Of course you can talk. And yeah. I give examples of the book of people who had way more divisions than you do with the guy in the Bernie Sanders t-shirt or the Make America Great Again hat, yeah. hat that got over it and were able to talk. But even going back to like my grandparents' day, they used to have like barbecues, neighborhood barbecues, which no one has anymore. In fact, yeah. a third of Americans have never met their neighbors. Um, and they would always invite the crazy guy from the corner who always was talking about conspiracy theories and they'd just go, ah, that's Ralph, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. They didn't be like, you're never coming back here again, Yeah. right? I mean, well, that was no, just totally. sort of, yeah. Well, that was actually, that ties perfectly into one of my other questions was I wanted to eventually touch on holidays and Thanksgiving because like my grandfather and, and his and my great aunt, they were known for their debates. We have this amazing photo of them sitting there, having a conversation, you know, arguing back and forth, totally opposite sides. But at the end of the day, you had a glass of Anazette, you gave a hug, it was Thanksgiving, you had a great time, right? Right. But now I feel like last year alone, and, and I've been watching this happen, where it's become this harrowing tale of like surviving Thanksgiving and how I to know. escape unscathed. And it's like, what happened? And so the question to all of this is, were we better at it back then? Or is it the nature of what we're talking about now? Or, or what has changed? Uh, I think we're, our conversational skills are just degrading. I mean, the thing of it is, is that conversation is a skill. And by that, I mean, it's like the gym. You don't go to the gym once, do a great workout, and then you're done for the rest of your life. Right. Like, conversation is something that you actually have to practice at. And we're not doing that. Yeah. We think think we are, but in fact, the average American adult spends almost 30 minutes a day texting and only six minutes on the phone. Some companies use the phone so little that like Coca-Cola and Goldman Sachs have gotten rid of their voicemail systems. I was actually shocked by that when I read that. Right? Yeah. So like, we're not actually getting any practice at it. So it makes perfect sense to me that we're starting to really suck at it. Um, of course we are. We're not doing it. When we can send a text, we send the text. When we can send an email because we think it's going to avoid an argument, we send the email instead. How often do people actually pick up, actually use their smartphones as a phone? Not often. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, exactly. the, it's probably the least used function. Absolutely. Of device, if exactly. I had to, if I had to guess. Um, we're, we're coming down to the, the wire here. I'm going to have to turn the audience Q&A in a little bit, but we've talked about all these things, that the, how we got here, what, where we are, and what's happening. Uh, obviously, to fix that, read the book. But since I have you here, what are what are some great tips that we can impart? How can we push that needle in the other way, in the other direction, and start improving? Yeah, so I hate to cut you off, but you said we're getting short on time. And the first one is one that we already know to do, which is don't just put your cell phone down, put it away. Because there's really good brain science beginning to emerge that shows that the phone is a distraction to you even when it's just sitting on the table, not making any noise, and you yeah. feel really great about it that you're not looking at it. Um, put it away. The other thing is turn off your notifications because you, you do not need to know every single time someone retweets you and you don't need to know every single time somebody likes your post on Facebook and what you don't realize is the effect that it's having on your gray matter. It is distracting you to a point that you are totally unaware of and it's having effects throughout the rest of your life. So don't let your smartphone change your brain, yeah. right? Shut it up. Is it scary because uh, we're also connected to it now and uh, younger generations are growing up with that device? They don't know a world without that device. Is it a matter of setting up screen time as a parent? Is it a matter of dividing and like taking it away and having them get used? How, how do you as a parent do that? And, and yeah, I mean, that? number one, you have to model that behavior, yeah. right? You can't set limits on your kid's smartphone time and then be sitting there during dinner on your phone, um, which means set the rules for yourself first <laughs> um, and then you can worry about your kids but yeah you should set aside some time when there's no 
phone. Yeah. I mean, the average American sets, checks their phone every six seconds in the evening hours. I have somebody backstage checking mine for me right now. Right. They're going to fill me in. Yeah, after. right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you can't like, not do it. You do, you, exactly. It's an addiction at this point where you're not even aware of how often you're checking it. Yeah. So, just set aside some time. And they actually have apps as ironic, ironic as that is, your sm smartphone can help you put it down. They have apps that will shut off all the notifications during certain hours of the day so that if you're at a meeting, it'll turn them off. Or if it's the, like, I, my cutoff time for social media is 7 p.m. Hmm. And I'm done. Got it. Yeah. 7 p.m. Well, that's one comforting because then we know that the robots will not uprise and take over. They might still. Well, but. if they're willing to make that app, unless that app oh. is part of gaining our trust. Oh. Going down a rabbit hole right. here. Um, but... <laughs> we, uh, I could do this all day with you. I'm having a blast, uh, but I do regrettably have to turn it over to the audience. Not that I don't love you guys, um, but <laughs> the book, it just came out. Uh, guys, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, we need to talk, how to have conversations that matter. Let's go ahead and get to our first question. It looks like it's right here in the front row. Hi, Celeste. Hi. Uh, so you spoke about conducting interviews and some of the best practices. What would you say are three tips that you have for conducting like the ideal interview? Okay, first of all, actually read the book. I can't say that enough. Most people don't. Um, and the author knows. <laughs> Just tell you that right now. The second thing is don't come in with a list of questions to ask. Um, what I do instead of that is I, I come in with an arc in my head. So any interview, like anything else that human beings do, is a story. And what you're really doing in that interview is storytelling in real time. So what I come in is with an arc. I say, here's the beginning, here's the middle, and here's where I want to end. And that's, what, that's the structure that I have in my head. So I'll know what my first question is, and that's it. Um, I've done my homework, so as they talk, hopefully I'm going to actually be responding to what they say. I actually heard an interview, and I won't say where I heard it, but somebody, they were interviewing, they asked him a question. At the end of the, of the guest's response, they said, and oh my lordy. And then he says, so uh, back in 2012 or what, I was like, she just, she just, she just said, oh, my lordy. Like, <laughs> oh, my lordy, what? Now I'm going to be worried for the whole rest of the interview about what oh, my lordy's about. So actually, that's the third thing is really listen to what they're saying. And if you need to take a break, oftentimes when you're in an interview, you're afraid of silence, and it makes you start to sweat. But don't be afraid of silence. Just take a breath before you ask the next question, and then really hear them all the way out to the end of their sentence. We had uh, James Spader who was here yesterday, and you want to talk about being afraid of silence. He's amazing to watch, and uh, watching our guy talk to him, he would take these long, pregnant pauses in between his thoughts, and you didn't know if he was done with his thought or if an amazing like little nugget was coming. So you kind of had to just be brave and wait it out. Nine times out of ten, he would say the craziest, most awesome thing you've ever heard with that James Spader voice. Right. But, but it really was an exercise of like, don't be afraid of the silence. Exactly. Let the silence happen. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Uh, great question. Next one. That is a good question. Uh, Hi, thank you Hi. for being here. Um, so obviously it seems like interviewing is like a lot of a learning curve, you know, just kind of learning things as you go along. Um, so is there any specific uh, talk or interview that maybe may have lended itself to your book or just kind of, you know, taught you something that you now, you know, hold with you? Yeah, I mean, one of the guests that I talk about in the book is Salman Rushdie, who happens to be the person I've interviewed more than any other guest in my 19-year career in radio. The last time I interviewed him, he said, I said, you know, I checked. I've interviewed you more than anyone else. He goes, and he said, people will talk. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, he was kind of a revelation to me because he is so good at listening. And he's also um, one of the funny, just truly authentically funniest people I've ever spoken to. And I think that's because he doesn't tell jokes. He just is who he is. And if he needs to take time, he does. And he just answers directly. I mean, he, he's thoughtful and he really listens to what you're saying. In his last book, there was a genie and her magic was listening. That was her magic. Um, so Salman Rushdie taught me a lot about um, how to, and in fact, it was partly going, man, I am way worse at this than Salman Rushdie, which could be said of a lot of things. Yeah, um, you're setting a high bar for yourself. Right, yeah. right, but conversation was the one I was worried about, yeah. Very cool. Uh, we have time for one more question. It's going right Hi. here from the front so, row. So uh, throughout your years of um, uh, being in radio, was it easy for you uh, at first to interv uh, interview your guests, or did it take time for you to learn through experience of how to become a better interviewer or 
It's really hard. And the very first interview I ever did in my entire life, this was back in like 1999. At that time, this very famous Native American uh, flutist, R. Carlos Nakai, became the first Native American to be nominated for two Grammys in the same year. And there was this huge discussion going on about whether he would go to the Grammys or whether he would boycott. And he doesn't feel any need to do interviews. But he said, you know what, I'll give one interview to my station in my own town in Flagstaff, Arizona, and he said, I'll give it to Arizona Public Radio, and that's it. And they said, hey, Celeste, this is your first assignment. <laughs> Get on out. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I probably wet myself. I mean, I just, I'm the, I'm the kid that was always overprepared for tests in school, so that's all I did was spend like a week doing way too much homework, which of course made me more wound up and more like careful about what I was gonna ask questions of, and I'm sure I don't even know whatever happened to that interview, it's alive somewhere and embarrassing me, but um, I'm sure it was terrible. Um, but yeah, I mean eventually you get over it and you, you make mistakes constantly and you just learn to, well there was a huge possibly career crushing mistake. We're gonna chalk that up to learning experience. <laughs> exactly. that was, um, well. <laughs> well, that's the thing, you don't, and, and this is when I, I hate asking in absolutes like this, but do you remember a particular interview throughout all of the many that you've done over the years that kind of stuck with you because it was difficult and you learned from it? Something that you walked away going, that was painful, but now I know this, this, and this. Yeah, forward. and I actually was pretty honest. I tried to be as honest I could about that in the book and put lots of embarrassing examples of mistakes that I've made because I don't want to make it feel like I'm sitting here going, okay, now here's how you behave. Right. 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 Um, I know these things really well because I've screwed them all up. Um, and there was the one after the earthquake in Haiti where um, there was a woman in, who's Haitian and she lives in Michigan and she hadn't heard from her family in days and she didn't know if they were alive or dead. And our producers worked their tails off and they finally got a hold, uh, they found her fiance and they got a cell phone to him and we reunited them on live on air for the first time right Great radio gold great moment right yes incredible moment in fact and i was so caught up in how clever and fantastic we were that i wasn't listening closely enough to what was happening yeah. and he told her while we were live on the air that her niece had been crushed by a building and she starts sobbing yeah. and it was horrible it was horrible and I still like right now I still yeah. like feel it in my chest that you know that I had gotten so caught up in my own genius and how great we all were you that were I, I stopped listening to them yeah. yeah exactly I stopped listening and it was it was bad well, yeah. well again you, and you learn from it though yeah and I think that's that's one of the that's the, kind of the fun of all those stories that you tell where you do kind of mess up and screw up because we all mess up and screw up but you also emphasize that's how you learn that's exactly. how you figure these things out exactly um once again I can say it a million times I could hang out and talk to you all day yep. uh, but I know you have a lot of these to go do rightfully so so I'm gonna have to let you go but guys uh thank you for your great questions once again we need to talk uh, I cannot recommend it highly enough it was a really great read thank you so much thank Celeste you. for being here absolute pleasure Celeste Headley, everybody. Thank you. Celeste Headley.